Welcome to Healing Generations, a podcast creating a dialogue uplifting the importance of healing, strengthening, and supporting our communities, and that addresses the disparities and inequities in communities of color. Healing Generations is brought to you by the Healing Generations Institute, a collaborative initiative of the National Compadres Network and the Brotherhood of Elders. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on our new releases. Oh, Matthew. I want to welcome all of you today to the Healing Generations uh, podcast here in which we go on a journey. We begin a conversation, we continue a conversation that really focuses on bringing the medicine of generations of all our ancestors and all the folks that have come before us that raised us and taught us and healed us and blessed us up uh, so that we can deal with generations of trauma that that, uh, many of our communities and and all of us are facing today. And I want to begin by by thanking Creator and acknowledging all of our ancestors uh, as well as your ancestors. You know, take a moment, take a breath and Acknowledge all, all of your relatives and your ancestors that came before. We give them thanks. We acknowledge them. We ask them for permission for us to be able to speak and share in these ways and talk about these these teachings and this medicine. And uh, at the same time, we acknowledge the land that we, we, we sit on. I'm on the Tangwa Gabrielino land here in the, in the Los Angeles area and want to acknowledge those relatives, but acknowledge all the relatives of all people of all ways today. And just thank you for joining us. Thank you for spending the time. Thank you for, for bringing your spirit here as we collectively in Kloke Nawake, you know, attempt to to learn how to how to heal and balance ourselves and heal and bring peace to the world that way. So thank you, thank you so much. And you know, today uh, I'm very happy, and joyful today, uh, because um, I have with us today. We have with us today is is just a really good brother, a uh, good camarada compadre, homie, partner, you know, uh, warrior, you know, wisdom keeper. This brother's, you know, been on this road for a while. And, you know, it's one of the examples, one of the examples of, you know, someone that has uh, lived his life and been through some teachings, but, you know, landed on his feet and and really, you know, brings many blessings and many teachings uh, in so many ways to so many communities, you know. And, and I feel honored to call him my brother. I feel honored to call him, you know, one of our people and one of our teachers that way. And and uh, he also does a lot of work in community, you know, direct work in community. Uh, he's, uh, you know, from that danza tradition. He's going to talk about that a little bit too. But as a family man, as a as a father, grandfather, and, and probably tío to many, 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 a lot of people call him uncle, you know, that way because of, um, you know, the way he walks and, and the way he lives his life. So... And who I'm talking about is my brother, Roberto Castro. And Roberto, I want to welcome you here today and thank you for you know agreeing to join us today and, and share some of your, your teachings today. So I'd like you to, to welcome the folks. Well, thank you everybody for that might be listening to this whenever um, it gets disseminated to the community. And thank you, Jerry, for the nice words. And for me, it's just like acknowledging the directions. I guess that's the simplest way because mm. um, there's guardians or there's symbols for each direction and so to acknowledge them and... And also, too, you know, like the land acknowledgement, the Yokuts, the Chalchillas, and Monos, and all the local tribes here from the Sierras and the Valley. Some present, some probably not around no more, but the ones that are, you know, just a couple of weekends ago, we were in Mariposa, and there was more tribes there, and they have their own names. So to acknowledge them, my family and the extended family from South Dakota to Querétaro to Zuni to all the different neighborhoods and Atlan. So I could, there's a, quite a few, so to acknowledge them and hopefully this conversation, because now I'm already feeling and listening to you, Jerry, that this is an intentional conversation. Mm. So con todo respeto, con todo respeto, I will share whatever kind of thoughts and questions that you ask. Mm. Thank you, brother. You know, and, you know, we always begin, you know, and, and it's, it's a traditional way of, of our people to, you know, when you meet somebody or when you gather again, is to talk about, you know, the essence of who someone is. And not so much in who someone is, but who's in the, the road that they walked and the, the relatives that they've come from. So I wonder if you'd bless us up by by just starting out with talking about you and your people and your journey of, uh, you know, Roberto Castro, bro. You know, where you're from and, and where your people and, and share a little bit about the blessing of that. Oh, my name is Robert Castro. I'm 64 years old, born in 1957 in Fresno. 
Mm. And my parents met in college. Um, they're both from Southern Cal. My mother was born in San Francisco, my father in San Diego. And they met in college, and then um, they made us. Mm. And so in 1962, we moved from Fresno to San Jose. I was four years old. My, they got work there. My mother's parents, I don't have a lot of information. They're from different parts of the country. Uh, my father's parents, they're from Baja, Baja California Sur, because Baja is two states. And I know a lot of, more about that side of my family. My grandparents were born in a little town called Miraflores. So besides our European uh, mixture, we're also Pericoa native descendant. On that part of my family, been in that part of Baja for 300 years. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't too hard to trace what lineage we are, you know, besides the other nationality. So I've been lucky. And, you know, unfortunately, some of us we rely on DNA tests to tell us about a percentage of our native lineage because, you know, what happened to our country more than 500 years ago, you know. Mm. And, um, yeah, that's me. I have uh, four daughters, two sons, 15 grandkids, four grandkids. My kids are all grown up, and I've been with the same partner for 47 years, 48 years, I believe now. We met in high school. And, um, you know, we, we live here in Los Baños now. It's all we could afford. So I, I frequent San Jose and other areas, and it's time for a visit to L.A., all right? There you go. Yeah. It's time for a visit. But, yeah, I don't know. I just basically to get this started, you know, before you ask the next question, which I know is going to be pertinent, everything I do is based on love. Mm. Yeah. You know, that journey, you know, from Fresno to San Jose to Los Baños, you know, I, I know you've gone on a lot of other journeys uh, throughout your life, and and we all go on journeys, man. And some sometimes we get sidetracked and <laughs> and end up different places, and and but they're all about teaching us something, you know. Whether uh, whether we're doing it in a good way or struggling, you know, all of us have, you know, in our indigenous teachings, we we talk about that duality, you know, the day and the night, the lo bueno, lo malo, cargas and regalos. We all have that. We all come from that, and we all learn from those things too. So I wonder if you can share a little bit about, you know, some of the, the, the journeys and, you know, the, the straight roads and the crooked roads and all of that stuff and, and what you learn from those, uh, the, that, that journey in life, you know. Well, to get personal, you know, hopefully this can, it's not something I talk about every day to everywhere. I'm not really shy about it, I guess. Cause, but if it can help someone, um, my parents both worked and I found out early on that my father had some kind of problem, a drinking problem, violence problem. Mm -hmm. I remember once a little kid seeing him break up some furniture, and it kind of, I remember this day to this day that what what happened, he broke a table, and I was like shocked, like, oh, that about, like, freaked me out, scared of my dad, right? So, you know, as I grew older, he would become more Christianly and violent. I seen him throw my mother down once. They were out drinking. I don't know how he drove back. They went out somewhere, and they started off probably to have a good time, but came back pretty intoxicated, both of them, but mostly him. My mom really didn't have a drinking problem per se, so that night, I don't think they were doing anything, you know, like to to out there and purposely cause problems. But he was drunk and he threw her down on the ground. And I remember the next day, she uh, found out she had broken ribs. Mm. And so, you know, uh, my dad would beat on us like if we were late or if we got bad grades or stuff like that, you know, pretty bad. And uh, one time I came home late, I don't know, it was like 15 minutes. He really beat me pretty bad, you know. And um, another time, I forget what it was, why he hit me with a belt. He was a belt belt guy. Some of us older people, you know, we went through that belt and shoe and mm -hmm. stakes. And, um, but the belt, you know, when he hit me with that belt one night, it cut my back open until the part where it bled a little bit. Mm -hmm. And my mom really never said nothing. She's probably afraid. But that night she came and she says, oh, your dad told me to come and check on you. And she was kind of dabbing the blood a little bit. I wasn't bleeding profusely, but I did cut my skin. And the next day I had scarred. And they didn't have like a CPS thing back then. It never got to that level. She probably should have. Um, but it, that was a trauma that I started, that was, um, introduced to young, on a young age. Mm. So as I got older, you know, throughout my life, and I noticed every so often I'd have these episodes where I lose my temper. And I'd blow up. I'd blow up and I'd lose it. And after the second or third time, like months would go by, maybe every six months, once a year. And I remember the age five when I was a late teenager to early twenties. I think by the time I was early 20, I started figuring it out, like, something's wrong with me. Why am I, why am I, um, like, I felt sick. And that's really what I went through. And I don't really talk about that to people, you know. 
And I didn't know about PTSD. I didn't know. I never even heard of that, you know, or trauma. I just knew something was wrong with me. And But then, uh, you know, little by little, I think uh, walking this journey is what really helped me. You know, my mother had got cancer. They were split up. My, my mom got tired of him beating on us, and so she divorced him. But before that, she started having affairs with his friends. One was my compadre, my dad's compadre, my padrino from confirmation, because we were a Catholic family back then. Este señor era un charro, because we lived in the country for a while. And so we raised on caballos, and there was a little pull out of land near us, and the señor used our electricity and set up shop, and he had a furniture shop and caballos. So part of it was good, because I learned how to make birria and ride horses, and really, really what a char, what a, you know, ranchero is. I can, I really know that life, but the other by part was that señor was just using my family. He was having an affair with my mom, so I found out when I'm in my 20s, I'm already a street dude, right? I'm already like a homeboy, like, I already left the house, I'm running the streets, and I always had a sense of fair play, so I'll say that much. So there's certain things you just don't do, right? Mm. Because where I'm from is sort of like East Los, there's, there's rules, bro. You know, the older, the older um, brother, we call them carnales, or the other homies that are more serious, like, you don't want them to pull you over, like, if they pull you over, it's about, it could be good, but it can go crooked if you're not, if you're messing up. But that was our body, how, how people looked out for each other, right? But I found out that he had put his hands on my sister when she was young. He touched her up. He did some kind of molestation. And my mom was sick, you know, with cancer. And I confronted him, and I told him in Spanish, because by then I spoke Spanish, and I told him in Spanish, hey, when my mom goes, you guys got to bounce, eh? I told him, you don't have no respect, man. She died on December the 12th, 1983, the day of the Guadalupe. So night she died. And my sister had a boyfriend from East Los. I met him. He was from Maravilla. Um, Lomitas Mara. Across in the rock. Because I went down there with him one time. And um, he was with me, man. It was just me and him. And I jammed all those guys up. Because they, they were partying. And you know, I don't know. And I told him. Like, confronted him before. But that night, man. It's like I said. You, you, I, I confronted him by myself. And I don't know. One thing led to another. We changed words. And. He took a swing at me and I dodged it and I threw the sombrero off his hat and punched him. And then they all pulled guns on me and I had a little shot. I had a little pump in the, in the bushes and there was a fence dividing whatever property they're using in, in our, in our house. And I cocked back that 12 gauge with number four uh, magnum buckshot. And I was ready, like, I told him, you don't got no honor, bro. You act all, all Antonio Aguilar, but you don't have no honor, bro. Mm. And so I almost pulled the trigger, I flinched, I almost pulled the trigger and then I don't know. The next day, he sent his brother for, to charge me in a duel. And this was some serious stuff. You talk about gang violence. This is different, bro. Yeah. This was different. And so he says, okay, ¿por qué no te matemos? ¿Por qué te, nos, te conocemos de chiquillo? Because we didn't kill you because we known you since you were a little kid. He goes, agarra tu chingadera y vente para acá atrás. He said, get your, get your stuff and come out in the back. So I did. I had a 22 with 19 hollow points, see? And I went, I went through the window. I didn't want to just kind of go back there. Because these dudes had experience doing that stuff, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I looked through a little window, and that fool was waiting behind a, a horse trailer, eh? I said, oh, this dude, all right. So the only thing I could do, because my kids were there, my wife was what? Three of my kids were there, my wife was at laund the laundromat, and my friends were there, and they got all scared, you know? So I put my friend in the middle closet, and I just put myself in the, in the kitchen cabinets so I could see the entranceway, and I just waited. I said, if you come through them, I'll spray them, you know? And so that's a lot of where I... First, my basis of PTSD came from it. Mm. Nothing happened. My friends got scared to call the cops. <laughs> mm. They got scared to cheese up on me. <laughs> I don't blame them, right? <laughs> yeah. So they called the cops, and then they, they got that guy, and then I hid my gun, and I took off. They were looking for me, too, but I just left. And weeks later, I got a subpoena from the DA's office, and I just called the jail. No, nothing happened, man. We just, whatever it was, we squashed it. Because, you know, we're learning not to be rats, you know? Right. I pride myself in that, bro. And so, you know, I started doing drugs, eh? I did. That was 83 around there. I did heavy drugs, a lot of coke. I got strung out, 87 around the bank. Put my older kids through that. Dad going on a mission, dad gone, dad buzz. I uh, didn't bring a lot of drugs and alcohol to the house. You know, not then. Not after all that happened. Um, growing on the east side, we were in another house where I partied a lot. But, you know, our thing was low riding and cruising. Which is, I'm gonna reel back the tape even before all that. Um, we were exposed to police brutality in our lowrider days in the 70s. And we fight back. I stabbed their tires, bust their windows. You know, anger 
from my dad, but then it was just wasn't right what they did to us. Right? And I didn't need no movement, bro. I didn't need, I wasn't part of the movement to go find, to be equal to them. You know, so, but it was a combination of things. Bottom line is, I got busted. Before I got busted, I ran for seven months and I got clean. I was hanging out with some guys uh, from the Black Berets. We're all, I was associated with them, the Black Berets, and they were aligned with the American Indian Movement. Maybe that was my saving grace from going too far, right? Mm. And so we'd sweat every week, and so that kind of helped me start to get back on track. And the older you get, or in my case, I wanted to be a father. Mm. It wasn't my kids' fault that I, that I went through all that, and the older ones saw a lot of that, me going through my stuff because of what happened to me. And so I got sober and you know, did my time, which wasn't cool. It wasn't cool, you know, doing time as a Chicano. Because I went, I went through the time during the guerras, you know what I mean? And so I never got clicked up, but, you know, things happen, bro, and you defend yourself, you know, the best way you can. And, and I got out, you know, I got out, and it's the, um, I had no nanny from Barrios Unidos. And I told myself, having a Chicano movement background, it helped a lot. And I told Nani when I got out, because I didn't have, like, like, I've always, I'm always careful, bro. Like, I don't have, like, nobody saying I owe them anything or, like, no, I had kids, you know. They were my priority. Believe it or not, even my own crooked way, my kids are my priority. Mm. So well, I told Nani, hey, bro, I want to help you, man, because in my mind, after I saw what the gangs really were, I didn't wind up on no dropout yard. It's different now. It's a lot harder for the younger ones. They have all those politics, but it was clear cut. You know, if you, if you had to get down, you got down. Bottom line. And, um, sink or swim, right? But now it's like, <clears throat> it's just a lot of curvy things kids gotta go, the young ones gotta go through. But when I got out, you know, I told myself, man, I'm gonna, I wanna help Nani. I told him, yeah, I wanna get involved, bro, cause these kids don't know what they're going through. And I had enough, like, confidence that I had somewhat good character that I didn't have to worry about looking over my shoulder what anybody was going to say by me work doing that kind of work. Cause I've always had always been about that, you know, you know, put aside whatever goes on in there. It is, it's just what it is. But, and just to being a family man. So the movement back, background helped me a lot, Jerry, like to get back on track and then, um, get more involved in the cultura, Sundance and then Danzante. We got, we started the first dancer group in 1987. And then when I went into the Sundance, oh, I don't know, shortly after that. That really helped me straighten out. Going to the mm-hmm. Sundance really hit me, helped mm-hmm. me straighten out, you know. You know, first of all, brother, let me just thank you. Mm-hmm. You know, because I know that that sometimes uh, just remembering, reflecting, as you're, as you're reflecting, I'm reflecting too, man, reflecting mm-hmm. on the, you know, the locura that you go through as a young kid. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, trying to figure it out, trying to deal with it, you know, the, the craziness, the pain, the, the shame. You know, seeing uh, your dad that way, and then seeing your, the way you treat your mom, and and all these feelings as as young boys, you know, not knowing how to deal with all of that, and and for a lot of us, not knowing how to resolve it either, and not knowing what to do with it, and so you know, many of us end up you know using drugs because that's the only way we can survive, you know. But the coraje never goes away; the anger just sits there, you know. And then we are in these di- different circumstances, you know. But, you know, what hit me right now is that in spite of all of that, in spite of all the locura, in spite of the madness, in spite of the anger, you know, what you come back to is you wanted to be a father. And then hooking up with, you know, somebody like Nane that had, you know, a background in in our culture, in our movimiento, and then, of course, now the medicine, you know, Sundance. And and so, you know, a lot of people don't, don't recognize that journey. And and even though, you know, even though we get better, it doesn't mean that the coraje goes away. It doesn't mean that those memories go away. It doesn't mean that sometimes those, the, the PTSD doesn't crop up once in a while, you know. And that's why, you know, I think, you know, our culture and our medicine and those traditional ways are so important. Can you talk, I mean, you, you mentioned you began talking about Sundance. Can you talk a little bit about about that journey? And, you know, and you mentioned Adansante, you know, I know... You know, you have your your own danza, you know, Carpool, you have it in, and that's a major part of your life too, you know. So how did you get there? How did you get to really being involved in the medicine and the traditional way and then danza? Because I know that's a really important part that you've helped a lot of people with. Thank you. Um, I guess what stands out more is the Sundance because it helped me learn about being a person, 
mm. because there's virtues, you know, and I paid attention to all that. And a lot of guys I associated with, like I said, in the movement, they were sun dancers. They were from that old AIM, Chicano Indian movement, DQU, Big Mountain, Wounded Knee, and then struggles up here, up in the in California territory. They talk about Chiloquin and Blue Creek fishing rights, mm -hmm. a lot of stuff like that. But they kept talking about sun dance, and I wasn't ready. I know I wasn't ready. So I, I didn't think that was something to play around with, you know. And so when I finally went, you know, the first time I went up and went into the harbor, this man was, uh, he had his son, he was already hooked up, he was going to drag skulls, and his son was sitting on the skull, because you have to have someone to sit on the skull, preferably a kid, because you're going to break, right? The weight resisted. And I looked at the son, the guy's son, and his face was all burned up, mm. like all scarred up, like, you know, no eyebrows and face was disfigured, because he had been burned, obviously. Mm -hmm. But he was healthy, he was like healing. And um, right at that moment, I knew why he did that. It was for a son. And so that was healing. That's when I had a realization, you know, what what those ceremonies mean. It's like it's beyond just people talking about it. It's a way of life. And so people have miracles in their culture and their religion. That that kid got better afterwards. Oh. He got. I watched him grow up. I went there every year, and, I, and he went better. And then, as far as the dance part, you know, because the Sundance, we're still learning. I don't care how many years you go. There's people that go their whole life with full blood, mixed blood, and they still don't know what the heck they're doing. Mm. Bless their hearts. So it's a learning journey, listening, you know, feeling, being respectful, trying to... Humility, as you know, is elusive in the city. But at least try to understand humility and try to live humble. On Danza, you know, um, I think every time there was an event in San Jose, cause we seen Matachina, there was no Danza in San Jose. Mm. They would come from San Francisco or from um, Sacramento when we had events. And there was a summer festival, summer festival put on by the Indian Center when they had one in San Jose, and it was at Proust Park. And I saw Marco and Chewy there. Mm. And I thought, man, you know, already movement, and already a little bit of cultura. Why don't we have a dance group in San Jose? What kind of rasa here? And I didn't know anything. And I asked mm. him, no, I used to David, David Vargas. Ask him, talk to him. And they didn't say, you got to do X, Y, and Z. They said, talk to that guy. <laughs> <laughs> so he became our teacher, and then uh, he broke away from a group, and they had their own little politics, and... It's been a long time. At the time, I was out on bail for that bank robbery. That was 87. So that's when they started their practice, and he, he called the group to Calipoca, October 1987. And so they were the first dance group in South Jose. And I know another guy says he, he was, and I know for a fact, because I'm from there, they didn't have a group. He had a practice, but he didn't have a group. He lived in San Francisco, the other guy. All due respect, he, he did teach us some stuff, too. So anyway, it's not like a one-up or props, but that's the story, the history. We were the first dance group in San Jose, and we're still learning. We danced in Quereta, I don't know. Um, it was a little different then, you know. It was a little bit different then, and I think we're a little more intentional. They did, you know, people did public presentations, but I don't know, it's just it was a different time, I guess, you know. And so what is the danza, you know? What does that mean to you? What is the purpose of, you know, for those people that, that really don't understand it totally, the whole aspect of danza and the ceremonia and everything you do with from the drum to the trajes to to the ceremony? What, what is the meaning of that for you? It, it, it all does have meaning. Even the steps have meaning. And I try to look at it as something traditional. And there's, every culture has two parts to it, right? Social and ceremonial. Mm. And a lot of us haven't figured that out because we're, look, we're raised up at, you know. So social dance is like, you know, exhibition, sharing your dance, more fun. Um, what we have now, uh, the friendship dance, if we do that, it's like a social dance, right? You're celebrating. Ceremonial, like for us, I guess, the best thing, closest I can get to right off the bat, for in general, for everybody, would be like Dia de los Muertos. If we're going to dance for Muertos, that's not a show. You're honoring your loved ones, you know. And that's a minimum, Jerry. That's a minimum. There's a lot of other things. Every person has to um, approach it and utilize it the way that this feels right to them. We have a, a mindset because there's, as you know, in Mexico, there's concheros and there's mexicayo, right? Right. The concheros have a history, and the mexicayo have some history too. They want to follow more native. It's kind of what we do, but we respect the concheros in Querétaro. And, and Guanajuato, especially Querétaro, they are the oldest mesas there. And it has to do with the Chichimeca resistance. 
The Chichimecas never lost to the Spanish. They were never lost to them. Look up the Chichimeca War, 40 year war, and they never lost. So the cultura didn't come from Mexico City, it didn't come from Guadalajara, it came from Querétaro. Later on, you hear songs about Tlaxcala and La, v La Villa and some of the songs, some of the lavanzas. But the Chichimecas held on to it and they don't, a lot of them don't have the language no more. There's some small communities in north of Querétaro where they speak Chichimeca Jonas. There's Otomis there. But most of the Chichimecas that are danzantes now don't have their language, but they have a lot of old tradition. Old tradition, that's another story, right? Uh, and it's good. It's good for us because we're on a learning mission. And my compadre, bless his heart, I must mention his name, the Mesa Explandor Chichimeca from Querétaro, his uh, Barrio San Francisquito. His name's uh, Juan Gonzalez uh, Rodriguez. He's my compadre. Um, he comes from a long line of danzantes, like hundreds of years. And he's full-blooded Chichimeca. He can trace his roots back right there. And all the danzantes, when they go to Querétaro, they know about San Francisquito. Mm. It's Chichimeca. They have, he has an old map. That is um, their land there. And so I've been lucky, like, because we just want to learn. It's not going to change who we are, but it's going to change maybe how we, we look at the dance and each other. So I guess that's it. There's steps, you know. If you have a copiri that goes that way, como mm -hmm. that represents the sun. Mm -hmm. If you have one that goes back like that, that represents a warrior, like Cuauhtémoc. Mm -hmm. And so those are the basics, but a lot of people just play Squameca, and it has to do with balance, right? So... Am I saying too much? <laughs> no, 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 no. And, and, you know, so since we're talking about healing, mm -hmm. you know, how does danza, let's just say for you, for Roberto, how does how's danza heal you? What does it do to you? What has it done for you that is part of your healing journey, part of dealing with that, the trauma and all of that stuff? What does danza do for you and what does it offer for our people? And, and that's a good question because most people will know they've been dancing for a while. You could be having a bad day. He said, I'm going to go to inside. I'm going to go to practice, right? No, nah, I don't feel like going, but I'll make myself go. Okay, I'll go. And once you get there, you feel good. Mm. And so it's physical. If you can connect the physical part, because it's very strenuous, right? And the spiritual part, and then the good uh, feeling of people around you, you walk away feeling good. We were homeless for two years. Ooh, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago, we were homeless for not two years, two months. And it was the trip, longest camping trip I've ever been on. <laughs> it, it was stressful, bro. And we had two of our mm. kids with us. It was stressful. Mm. It was pretty depressing. Mm. It got, started to get depressing. I always try to like push forward and push forward and not get too. But one day my son cried. He was young. We want to get in the house. But I noticed when we went to dance practice, man, we'd feel better. So it's a combination of physical and spiritual, you know, and then the people you surround. It shouldn't be a place for people that are bickering or gossiping or they don't like so and so. and or well, it gets that, that kind of political. It shouldn't be like that. It happens because of human nature. But if you can put that aside and just um, go to enjoy and pray, you don't got to show off your prayers to nobody. That's your own personal prayers, you know. Focus on that altar. Focus on that copal, that smoke and, and that prayer. If it's water you pray with, whatever, however you pray. But pray like that and then watch. The, the things you're talking about, it, it's... You will relieve your stress and you'll, you'll feel a little bit better walking out of there. And that's something we need every, you know, regularly. Well, you know, you, I mean, and, and you, you mentioned some very significant things that I think, you know, I just want to lift up because first of all, you, you mentioned prayer and that sense of, of, of spiritually connecting with, with our spirits, with our ancestors, with, you know, the, the tradition of always honoring the ancestors in those ways, but also, you know, the, the sense of movimiento. You know, that, that trauma really is when we're stuck, when the pain is stuck, when our minds are stuck. With, but when, you're, when, the, when that drum hits, when you feel that drum, that wewet, that is, you know, that, that, those beats that are hundreds of years old, it wakes up that memory, it wakes up the genetic vibration of ancestors, you know, and then community comes together. You know, and, and one of the most beautiful things to me is when I see the danzantes all dancing together. Dancing in that in that interconnected we call it cloca nawake, you know that interconnected way, and it it does it it just brings joy. So I think that it's part of our healing medicine, and it's and if you do it in the intentional way that you mentioned, it's part of that healing medicine. But I truly believe, Roberto, you know I, I appreciate you sharing, you know that the the time and even that you were homeless, you know, but that you keep you kept dancing, 
and I believe, because I know, I know for a fact, you're not going to say it, but I'm going to say it, is that you have helped so many people just through the danza, just to continuing that drum going, just to opening in the door for people, for younger people that are looking to heal their wounds, looking to find their cultura, looking to hear that vibration. And you've brought them in and taught them and loved them and given them a place. And and you know, and, and I believe the ancestors bless you like that, right? So now you have a home and you have a bunch of kids and grandkids <laughs> and great grandkids and and you know, and I believe those are blessings, you know, that that out of uh, the sacrificio that way, you know. So, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if, if you can share, because out of all these years, you, you, you're, you're, you're an elder, you're in the sesentas, man, you know, we want to be young, but we're getting older, our bodies feel it, <laughs> everything feels it. You know, what, what are those teachings? What are some of the, you know, a couple of lessons that you've learned along the way through all of the trials and tribulations, but also through the ceremonies and through the tradiciones? Can you share a couple of teachings that, that have helped you, a couple of virtues that have helped you? you know, along this way. Well, yeah. Um, so just recently, you know, I've come to the conclusion because I was in uh, Rapid City, South Dakota, and they had a beautiful event, bro. And I need to, I need to address this, you know, think Delaney Apple and, and all the people out there, the new people I met, the community there the, at Lakota Homes and from the surrounding areas that did their, their horse camp and at Lakota Homes in Rapid City. Just thinking about that, I mean, I can go. That's a whole other story. That's a whole other podcast. It was beautiful. We could bring Delaney on sometime or yeah. somebody from out there because they have a lot. And it was a very good gathering. All all young people rode horses for four days. They started off leading them. Just they didn't know how to ride, and then by the fourth day, they were leading it. A little twelve year old kid leading all, you know, leading those horses around. And what I wanted to share too is about grieving, because in our barrios, you know, and out there in the res, in the city. A lot of people are hurting. Mm. The pandemic, you know, cancer, you know, heart attack, diabetes, violence. People die by violence still. You know, they just had someone, some guy kill a bunch of people in Buffalo, New York, right? So when the grieving time comes, you know, what I want to share with people, don't let no one ever tell you that grieving is something you got to get over. Grieving is the purest form of love there is. And that's, it's so pure, that's why it hurts. Because you're grieving for someone that's in spirit world. And you're connected to them through love. So don't feel bad about grieving. I mean, you don't want it to let you take you down. You might sob, you might break down, you might hear a song or a picture. It's okay. It's okay, because you still love that person, that memory. They walked with us at one time. So remember that, those that are grieving, you know. The other thing, too, is about if you're going to get involved in culture... Remember, culture is not just a blanket. Culture is language, your symbols, your artwork, your social gatherings. And then there's traditions and how you do about it. There's customs, which are taboo, do's and don'ts. And then there's rituals, which are specific. And for us to understand all those components, for young people that want to walk this way, go outdoors, go offer some tobacco to the water, go pray to a water lake, that's simple. Because when you talk about water as life, it's not, it's much more than that. So go outdoors, you know, spend time outdoors, look at the sky. The trees are full of life. They're our brothers, our sisters. The buffalo, the deer, the eagles, they're, they're our messengers, or they bring messages. Pay attention to the night, to the nighttime sky. And don't get stuck on cement and concrete and cell phones. Mm. <laughs> the cell phones eat us alive. Um, there's a whole lot, right? But the last thing is it, we can help all of us it's the four agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz, similar to Hove Noble, right? The tenets, right? And the two in the middle, don't take things personal and don't make assumptions. Mm. That's what we all struggle with, right? Because if you're miserable all the time and if you have a conversation with somebody, it's just negativity all the time, they're not healed yet. They're not working on healing. They're stuck in that loop, like you're saying. Mm-hmm. Try not to gossip. Gossip is it's a pitfall coming back to you. Watch your temper. Sobriety is important. People don't like hearing it. You know, sobriety is important. And in marriages, you know, marriages are, are, they're like a flower. It has thorns and it has a, a fragrance. You're going to have your good days and your bad days. But if you're with someone, don't mistreat them. Don't mistreat them, you know. And if you want to be unfaithful, try not to make a habit of it. 
because that can um, hurt someone's feelings. Like, man, if you're unfaithful to your women, wait till they're unfaithful to you, then you'll know how it feels. Mm. So be be careful. Watch your P's and Q's. You're, people are going to slip. You've been with someone for 50 years, you're going to slip. Um, the person you're with is not a slip up. There's somebody. But the act itself, maybe you shouldn't probably have done that. And that's, I'm telling you from experience of all the things I've been through, me and my, my, my pareja, and we, we grew up together since we were kids. We met just since we were kids. And so be patient. You know, it takes two, give and take, 50-50. I'll be honest and have an open conversation. But once again, um, sobriety is important. If you're going to learn culture too, um, your first teaching should be very, very strict. Very strict. The strictest one possible. Because that's the foundation of your house. If your house has a shaky foundation, it's going to blow down in the first storm. Because when these young people, when we're no longer around, or we're too sick, and the time comes, they have to make a decision. What do we offer them? They're going to think, what would, what would Jerry have said? I don't know what to do. There's a fork in the road. I got to make a choice. What would, what would have Jerry have said? What would Robert have said? And they'll remember. So I hope that makes sense. Yeah, no, no, it does a, a lot of sense. And I, and I appreciate your realness, brother, because, you know, I think sometimes we can just, talk about virtues and respeto and all of this stuff, but but life ain't like that. You know, life life throws challenges your way. And, you know, and what I've learned is once you think you figure it out, here comes a bigger challenge, like, oh, what do I do with this one? You know, I mean, you know, it, it it's not easy. And I think, you know, those virtues and those values, but those, those tradiciones, those ways, you know, sometimes, as you mentioned, you don't feel like going to danza. You don't feel like praying. You don't feel like, you know, but that's really what's going to get you through. You know, having those ways and having traditions, but also having people you can rely on, you know. And I know this because I know a lot of people that look to you. You know, I mean, lo bueno, lo malo, you're, you're, you're one of the, uh, you know, one of, you're one of our teachers. You're one of our guides. You're one of our elders. You, know, you and, you know, and Laura, you, you know, you're supposed to both of you. And that's a lot to carry but sometimes. It's a lot of responsibility. So, you know, I, I just want to take a moment to thank both of you. Thank you and her, because I know that, you all walk together, and sometimes it's hard to walk together, you know, uh, because we carry our wounds, we carry generational wounds, but we also are individuals still, even if we're a pareja, you know. Uh, me with Susie, too, we sometimes, you know, nos lleva bien, and sometimes, you know, I gotta, I, I'm going for a walk, man. <laughs> you know, sometimes you just gotta go for a walk, or, you know, that, that's the reality. But you mentioned something in the beginning that I think is really critical, is love, you know. That love is is not just romanticism. Love is sacrifice. Love is patience. Love is perseverance. And love is sometimes surrendering to, you know, the difficult things in life and, and knowing when you need help too. And and so I want to acknowledge you and you know Laura as well for the guidance and the blessings that you've given so many people. One more thing, not not to keep dragging it on, but I talked to a guy yesterday, right? And I asked him two things, you know. Do you know why you do what you do? Why do you do what you do, number one? And number two is, do you love the people? Do you love the people? And when you die, will the people love you? That we know he loved us. I'm talking about community. Mm -hmm. So I think that's important. I'll finish off with that. Well, you know, no, I, I want to ask you one more, one more question that is kind of a continuation of what you talked about. But I want you to think about the 18-year-old Roberto, right? And because there's young people that are listening, you know, and there's things when we think back, man, I should have done this, or I should have considered this, or I should have, you know, as an elder, you know, what consejos do you give that next generation to the younger rappers? As, as an 18-year-old, I don't have good advice, bro. Mm. I don't, I'll be, that's my honesty. To be honest, <laughs> at 18, I wanted to fight and I wanted to, me with girls. <laughs> no, but what would you tell that 18-year-old you? What would you tell that next generation? What kind if of advice anything, would you do? If anything, what, talking to myself at 18, if anything, what I realized when I turned 18, God, I was just being straight with you a minute ago. I learned that you're 18 now, so even though it's just um, government law, that you're an adult mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. the word responsibility. Um, and some people do. It's like because you're not all a young man, not growing up at 18. So maybe be patient with yourself, but start thinking about being responsible. Mm. 
because you're according to the law you're not a kid no more you're you're a man young man young woman but now or young gender neutral at 18 and now it's about being responsible so i think i tried i tried i could have been i could have been more responsible but at least i understood the word at the time it was a little bit like oh shoot i'm 18 now i better be responsible 30 years old then yeah and we'll talk on the next <laughs> podcast about being 30. <laughs> well, let's talk about 30. So what do you tell the 30-year-old then? <laughs> hey, what have you accomplished? And we all say mm. that. Oh, man, mm. I'm 30. I don't know. Then it's like, I better get it together. That should be a normal response. You shouldn't be 30 years old and still going in and out of jail. Mm. It happens. You know, I turned 30 when I was incarcerated. But when I got out, thank God I never went back to prison, bro. Because of my family and what I was doing. So I start seeing the value of a relationship mm. versus, you know, quick pleasure. Yeah. So by 30, you should have it together. You should. That should be a goal for all of us. So now as an elder, as we, you know, kind of put kind of the, the exclamation mark on, on, our, on our platica right here, what are you grateful for, brother? What has this life really uh, taught you and shared with you that you're grateful for? As we now come here, what what is what's the gratitude that you have? The ability to be intentional, because the clock's ticking. We're getting older now, mm. and I've learned not to respond to negativity. If somebody says something, especially close, because you know people can say stuff when lo tiras a loco, right? You don't pay attention, but a family or your loved one says something negative to you, and you especially you know you don't have it coming. It's nothing wrong with saying I'm sorry. Or apologizing and not repeating the same beat. But if you know you don't got nothing, you didn't do nothing wrong and they're ragging on you, <laughs> I, I don't respond. I'll just stay quiet and take it. Um, it doesn't feel good, but it feels better not to react. I'm grateful not having to, knowing how not to react to every negative situation mm. because it's not going to be any, a good outcome, you know? If you're angry, don't talk. And if you're that angry, don't speak because only bad things will come out and you could regret them later. And I'm, I am, that's what I'm grateful for. You know, I, for, and for every one bad thing you hear about, Jerry, there's five good things happening. Mm. If not 10, mm. it's just to make the news. Well, brother, I'm grateful for you. Thank you. You know, and, and that you're a, a good friend. You're, you know, one of the leaders in our community. I know your prayers uh, through your dance and when you go to Sundance and when you go to ceremony, you know, helps us all because it's in our belief that when one person does good, when one person offers prayers, when one person offers that medicine, it helps us all, you know. And and so I just want to thank you. Thank you for being, you know, a, a good brother, for being, a, you know, a good warrior, for being, a, you know, a good elder that way. And, and you know, and we'll keep learning, we'll keep praying, we'll keep laughing, keep, uh, you know, keep fighting for that peace and healing for our world, you know. But I really appreciate you and appreciate the time that, that you know, you, you shared here and the honesty, the honesty that you laid it all out that way, you know. You know, with that, you know, I, I want to just um, thank all of you that are listening and, and just remind you that, you know, brother right here started us out with love and then spoke the truth, you know, this truth about, you know, his journey. And, and I think we have to face our truth. And if we don't face our truth, then we don't know what we need to heal. But he also lifted up the, the importance of, of acknowledging our wounds. And that our wounds, you know, they're teachings for us. And they stay with us, but, uh, but not to let them control us, right? And this point of gratitude of not taking things personal. And knowing how to... Sometimes we just, you know, when things are tough, we just need to pray. We just need to sing. We just need to, you know, walk away. And, and in it all, we recognize that all of those things are really, you know, the, the prayers of our ancestors. You know, and so my prayer today to all of you is that you will recognize your sacredness and that any wounds and, and trauma that you have, that you will uh, find a way really to, to find that medicine and to reach out when you need to reach out. You know, uh, there are people like Roberto and others, Laura and other people uh, in communities that are waiting, waiting to bless you up, waiting to pray with you, waiting to guide you, and uh, waiting to love you up that way. So uh, as you do that, share it with other people. 
I want to thank you for listening today. And uh, you know, just remember the sacredness of your ancestor lies within you. Share it with others. Glasgow Marley. Thank you very much. For more information about Healing Generations and the Healing Generations Institute, visit nationalcompadresnetwork.org and be sure to subscribe to stay up to date with our new releases.